Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday to you. It's been a full week since I've talked to y'all. I hope y'all have all had a great week. Um, our week has been good and busy, and weather was good a couple days. Now today it's cold and blustery. Windy, 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 windy. Um, um, got a chance to get out, though, for just a few hours and get some of my Christmas stuff put away, but we still have my little poor Santas on the west side of the road drowning in snow and water and um, stuff frozen to the ground, you know, that I can't get up. So I'm looking forward to some nice spring weather here um, so that I can get out and get that taken care of because, you know, I have some Easter stuff I need to put up, of course. Um, so anyway, let's start out with our morning affirmations to remind you all. I am important. Today is going to be a great day. The world needs me. Today I choose happiness and I believe in myself. And today is a new and fresh start. Today I will do my best. And every day God loves me and I am his child. Absolutely. Praise the Lord for that. So we got a, a, a big list of prayers and acts of kindness um, for today, obviously, over a week. We get that. Um, so first off, um, prayers go out to Susie Oney from Fairdale here. Her mom has been hospitalized with some issues, um, and she's very concerned. Susie and her mom are very close, so please send some prayers out to Susie's mom. Update on Margaret Swanson. Um, her daughter informed me that um, she's going to be having radiation for cancer in her spinal cord area this week. Five days of radiation she's going to be having. So please, please, please keep her in your prayers. Um, my friend Kathy Weiss from Olivia, Bird Island area there, lost her aunt Mary Jane. So please keep that family in your prayers. Uh, my friend Mary from Wilmer had a minor surgery that went well, um, but requests prayers for continued healing, of course. Um, Jim and Bobby Peterson uh, from the Wilmer area lost Jim's mom, and uh, they're requesting prayers for their family as well. Our friend um, Kathy Nash is requesting prayers for her daughter-in-law, Kim, who has been diagnosed with breast cancer and facing surgery, um, along with some other health issues um, that are going to need to be put on hold now um, to get this taken care of. So prayers go out to Kim. Um, Bev Plumley, uh, my, my mom's cousin, is requesting prayers for her mom, who has cancer already, but is now down in Mayo with an infection. So this is really, really tough. Um, I think she said she was 84, or 87 to be struggling with both fighting cancer and now this infection. So please send prayers out for Bev's mom. So for acts of kindness, um, I have to read this one off of my phone. Um, I seen this. I thought it was neat. I'm going to try to use this with my church school kids. But um, this post says, my mom created a kind can. She used a big Nescafe tin can. Remember those from back in the day? Um, in the can went the names of every single one of my classmates. At the time she was young, but we could do it differently. And each morning before school, I would pull a name out of the can. That day, I had to go out of my way to do something kind for them and expect nothing in return. Well, we can do that with church school and we can do that with us. Put a bunch of names in the can and pull one out. How fun would that be? Make kindness fun, everybody. A big thank you goes out to Jada and Darren last night. We had a youth night last night that I snuck in, and oh boy, did we have fun. Uh, first of all, we're practicing some songs for Palm Sunday, and they are fun, fun, um, active songs. And so that was a lot of fun. And then we played four games. 
we played one where there was two teams and um, they had to roll an egg down past the chair with their nose. And then when they got past the chair, then the next one would go and see which team won. Oh, it was so hilarious. And then we did another one where they had 20 jelly beans that they, they had to put a spoon in their mouth. And um, they couldn't use their hands. I let the littler kids use their hands to hold the bowl, though. And they had to scoop the jelly beans out of one bowl and put them in another bowl. <laughs> so much fun watching them. And then um, another game we did was I gave everybody 10 pieces of candy. And then we rolled the dice. And if you rolled a one, you got to pick another piece of candy. If you rolled a two, you had to put the candy back in the pile. Rolled a three, so on, so on, so on like that. And then after 10 minutes, they, they got to keep the candy that they had. So that was fun. And what was the, oh, the last one was you take those plastic eggs, you know, and then, of course, they come apart. And so I gave each uh, one of the teams uh, they had a two-person partner team, whatever you want to call it. And they had to match up the eggs, yellow, yellow, you know, red, red, whatever. Uh, but they could only use one hand from one partner and the other hand from the other partner and put those eggs together. Now, that doesn't sound very hard, but it was. And I tried to match up, you know, a big kid with a little kid. Oh, it was just so much fun. And, you know, I had Darren and Jada you know, kind of helping me. Jada played the games. Um, but I really didn't have like a lot of help, help per se, because this night I did not need it. These kids, again, were incredible. I am not kidding you. And a big thank you goes out to Dylan, my sixth grader, um, because he helped me pick up the dice. He helped me pick up the eggs, clean up. He helped the younger kids um, with the jelly bean game. I mean, he was just so wonderful. God bless my kids. It was just awesome. Um, one of our other listeners shared that um, they bought lunch for a guy at the convenience store that um, said he was hungry but he couldn't afford one of the meals that was in the refrigerator. And so um, he just bought him a lunch. It was awesome. Love to hear that. Actually, I witnessed that, so that was pretty cool. Um, another person shared that um, a lady was at the grocery store, and they were behind her, and she came up $17 short. And so they covered it for her and helped her bring the groceries out to her car. God bless you. Um, <clears throat> I have been handing out a lot of banana bread lately. Um, actually, Darren's been taking, Darren's been handing it out. Um, he um, brings it to Park River Implement to the guys back in the shop. I gave some to um, Lever's Grocery Store and the Hardware Store because they're just such awesome people. Never get thanked enough for their service. And so, yeah, I've been doing some of that. Um, Lent on Wednesday night was awesome. We had a whole bunch of people in our skits. We had the Westland family, the Swanson family, um, the Johnson family, and then um, a couple of our parishioners from Lawton. And they did a skit on humility, and I want to thank them for that. They did such a good job because, you know, if you guys have watched our Lent services, they are not rehearsed because um, we just don't have time to get together and rehearse them with everybody's schedules. Um, but it's fun that way um, just to see how the kids and even the grown-ups in this case you know, how they react, how they do their lines. And, and this one was about a bunch of um, kids at the park that um, uh, were kind of, there was a couple of really nice kids there. And then some bullies came in, which was Steve Swanson, um, a dad. And, and he was a bully and he was mocking the nice kids and they were just going to walk away from it and all that. But then they decided, um, since they were arguing about who was the best at basketball, they were going to have a shootout. And um, whoever lost um, got a pie in the face. 
And the ending, anyway, is that the nice kid made the basket, Levi, and the mean kid, Dad Steve Swanson, missed the basket. And so he was, the dad then, the mean kid was supposed to get a pie in his face. But instead, the nice kid said, well, instead of a pie in the face, how about if we all just sit down and enjoy a piece of pie and eat? Um, so that's that was awesome. It was a great night. And thanks to the ladies for preparing, again, a great supper. And for um, the parents and kids that served the supper, God bless all of you guys. Our Lent has really, really been awesome this year. Um, oh, I just have to share with you something I'm super excited about. So I'm planning a mission trip uh, for um, four of our confirmation girls. And I've got it all set up now. Um, we are going to go to Duluth June 20th through the 24th. And um, we are going to um, serve a meal at the home, at, one, at an adult homeless shelter up there. Um, we are going to bring toys and um, spend part of the day playing um, with the kids at the homeless shelter for kids. Uh, the kids that are placed here due to neglect and abuse. Uh, super excited for that. Um, and we are going to help um, a church um, hand out um, food because they have a food pantry. And um, the last one is, oh, I'm waiting on this one. But there is a um, young woman pregnancy center. Uh, where young kids or, you know, early age women um, decide that they want to keep their child, they're pregnant and they want to keep their child. And so they move into this place and they um, this uh, place helps them um, to transition after the baby's born into their own place and learn life skills and all that stuff. Um, and so... Um, all of these places are, are church-based, uh, so which is great. And so not only will we serve there, but we're going to learn more about each organization as well. Um, and so I am so very, very excited about that. And we're going to do some sightseeing too, of course. While we're in Duluth, such a beautiful place, we have to take advantage of that as well. Okay, one more thing I want to share with you before we start our prayer. My mom taught us never to look away from people's pain. The lesson was simple. Don't look away, don't look down. Don't pretend not to see hurt. Look people in the eye even when their pain is overwhelming. And when you are in pain, find the people who can look you in the eye. We need to know we are not alone, especially when we are hurting. This lesson is one of the greatest gifts of life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Amen. Okay, so um, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today to ask your forgiveness and to seek your direction and guidance. We know your word says, woe to those who call evil good. But that is exactly what we have done. We have lost our spiritual equilibrium and reversed our values. We have exploited the poor and called it the lottery. We have rewarded laziness and called it welfare. We have killed our unborn and called it choice. We have shot abortionists and called it justifiable. We have neglected to discipline our children and called it building self-esteem. We have abused power and called it politics. We have pornography and called it freedom of expression. We have ridiculed the time-honored values of our forefathers and called it enlightenment. Search us, O God, and know our hearts today. Cleanse us from sin and set us free. Amen. Okay, my friends. Today we're going to go through two books because um, the rest of the books in the Old Testament are very, very short. And um, so we might as well kill Two birds with one stone. That was terrible to say about the Bible, wasn't it? But you know where I'm coming from. And so today will be just a tad bit longer. First of all, Hosea. We are into Hosea. And with this book of Hosea, 
I will go over the outline quick. Um, in chapters 1 and 3, we see Hosea and his unfaithful wife. Um, chapters 4 through 8, the unfaithfulness of Israel. Chapters 9 and 10, the judgment of Israel. Um, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11, God expresses his love for Israel. And um, chapter 11, starting with verse 12 through 13, verse 16, God expresses his anger against Israel's sin. And then chapter 14, the re uh, restoration of Israel. Now there's a few themes from the book of Hosea here. First of all, uh-oh, uh-oh, hang on guys, I gotta plug in my computer, I forgot about that. I disconnected it last night so I could bring it to the church so we could sing our songs. But, yeah. There. Did I save it in time? I did. Okay. Whew. All right. So the themes here. Disobedience separates us from God. Next, God judges and punishes disobedience. God is faithful and his love is everlasting no matter what. God calls us to repentance and God promises redemption and reconciliation. So Hosea revealed little about his background, though his book of prophecy here offers a few glimpses into his life. The prophet's name Hosea means salvation and is likely a reference to Hosea's position in Israel as a light of hope to those who would repent and turn to God because of his message. Now, following the command of God for Hosea to do this, Hosea married Gomer, G-O-M-E-R, a bride God described as a wife of adultery. Hosea and Gomer had three children, two sons and a daughter. And God used the names of Hosea's children along with his wife's unfaithfulness to send specific messages to the people of Israel. So I want to kind of explain that because I, I had to look that up too. So um, God is using um, adultery here uh, with a husband and wife to describe adultery to God. Okay, betrayal of God, just like adultery is a betrayal and a sin and disobedience um, to the spouse. He is comparing this to how he is being treated by the people of Israel. So in Hosea 1, the prophet identified the kings that ruled during his prophetic ministry. Okay, the first four, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, reigned over the southern kingdom of Judah from 790 B.C. to 686 B.C., while Jeroboam II ruled the northern kingdom of Israel from 782 B.C. to 753 B.C. Now, the reason I told you this is because this indicates that Hosea lived in the middle to late 8th century B.C., 755 to 715 BC, making him a present day prophet of Isaiah and Micah. Hosea directed the early portion of his prophetic warnings to Jeroboam II, a descendant of the house of Jehu, whose son Zechariah would soon come to ruin. Because this prophecy against the descendants of Jeroboam involved the birth of Hosea's children, we can conclude that he lived in the northern kingdom where the names of his children would have had the greatest impact. Now, more than any other, oh, let me explain that too. So um, when they're talking about the names, and we'll, we'll visit just a tad bit about this in a minute, um, but God told Hosea what to name his children, okay? Um, and they all had purpose and meaning to what was going on in Israel that day. So, and you'll see that in a bit here. 
So more than any other prophet, Hosea linked his message closely with his personal life, okay? So by marrying a woman, he knew what eventually betray his trust. And by giving his children the names that God told him to name them, that sent messages of judgment on Israel. So Hosea's prophetic word flowed out of the life of his family. The cycle of repentance, redemption, and restoration evident in Hosea's prophecy and even in his marriage remains intimately connected to our lives. This sequence plays itself out in the lives of real people like us, reminding us that the scriptures are far from just words with no relation to real life, because they are. Um, they work their way into our day-to-day -day existence, commenting on issues that impact all our actions and relationships. So throughout this book, Hosea pictured the people turning away from the Lord and turning to other gods with a small g. This meant that the Israelites lived as if they were not God's people. And though God told them as much through the birth of Hosea's third child, here we talk about that, Loami, okay? That is what God told Hosea to name his third child. He, he, and he told them this because it meant not my people. For Israel is not my people and I am not their God. Because they are worshiping other gods, and so he also reminded them that he would ultimately, though, restore their relationship with him using the intimate and personal language through the names of Hosea's children. So a couple of lessons we can take from Hosea is that God is faithful to his people even when they are unfaithful. Now in the book of Hosea, God uses Hosea's marriage to represent his love for his people. Hosea's wife was unfaithful and continually ran from Hosea and forgot about his loving care for her. She chased other lovers, but Hosea went after her anyway and brought her home. And we are so much like Hosea's wife when we chase after the things of this world rather than chasing God. God loves us and intimately cares for us, provides for us, protects us, and is completely faithful to us. Hosea didn't ask his wife to change, to earn his love, but rather his love for her was meant to change her. That is how Jesus Christ loves us. Jesus did not say, clean yourself up and get your life on track and earn my love. Instead, he says, I love you so much. I died on the cross for your sins. Don't reject my love. Give me your heart, your whole heart. Next, God disciplines his people when they are unfaithful. No matter how much he loves them, how much he'll forgive them, you're held accountable. Israel had been unfaithful to God and rejected him and replaced him with pagan idols. And God warned them that they would face judgment one day, but they refused to listen and continued their disobedience. Now, this happened slowly over many years, but when God's judgment came, it happened quickly. But even in their sin, if they turned back to him in righteousness, steadfast love, and seeked out to him, God would still bless them. But instead... They continued to trust in their own way and harden their hearts. If we too make bad decisions in our lives, we will suffer. Sometimes we might be tempted to think that we can get away with doing something wrong, but God always sees and knows everything. You can't get away with anything, and eventually it will catch up with us. God has a deep affection for his people. Now, the final chapter of Hosea is a beautiful chapter in the Old Testament. It reveals the loving heart of God as his people experience his mercy, love, blessings, and complete restoration after a time of discipline and judgment. God has a deep affection for his people. 
he compares his people to the beauty of a lily, the strength of the roots of, the tr of a tree, the value of the olive, and the delightful fragrance of Lebanon. It was not their sin that brought discipline, but rather their refusal to repent of their sin. Understand that. But God took no pleasure in knowing that they would face judgment. This didn't make him happy. But he promised to leave a small group of people there to restore them because of his deep affection for them. And in the end, the fame of Israel is restored as God promises to look after them and be like an evergreen cypress providing fruitfulness to them. Now, not only does the book Hosea provide an example of God's love to a people who had left God behind, but it also shows us what forgiveness and restoration look like in a close relationship with God. The book of Hosea illustrates that no one is beyond the offer of our forgiveness because no one sits outside God's offer of forgiveness. Certainly, my friends, God brings judgment on them who turn from him. But Hosea's powerful act of restoration within his own marriage set the bar high for those of us seeking godliness in our lives. Here we got the book of Hosea. Short but powerful. Same with Joel, okay? Um, Joel, the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So the outline with Joel is in chapter 1, verses 1 through 20. It's a plague of locusts and a call to repentance. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 27, the army from the north and a call to repentance. And in chapter 2, 28 through chapter 3, verse 21, the day of the Lord, which we will learn about. A few themes from the book of Joel here. Repent and return to the Lord to avoid judgment. God will judge all nations on the day of the Lord. God will bring salvation to his people and pour out his spirit. So the book of Joel calls the people of Judah to repentance <clears throat> and warns them and their neighbors of a future time when God will judge them. <coughs> Excuse me. It speaks of the day of the Lord. In that day, God will pour out his spirit on the nations. And the day is also one of judgment against God's enemies. That is why they call it the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now Joel assures that Judah's future safety from these threats and promises um, fulfill uh, redemption. Joel, whose name means Yahweh, Yahweh is God, is identified as the son of Pethuel. Nothing else is known about him. The exact date of the book of Joel is unknown and debated. Now, some scholars understand Joel as prophesying to the people of Judah between 609 B.C. and 586 B.C., just before their exile to Babylon, while others suggest a date following the exile as early as 515 B.C. or as late as 350 B.C., now, Joel's prophecy regarding the pouring out of God's Spirit was fulfilled at Pentecost. The coming of the Spirit upon all of God's people, without distinction of gender, age, nationality, or social standing, was part of the great day of the Lord. In uncertain times when God's people were threatened and surrounded by their enemies, God promised to bring salvation to his people and empower them with his Holy Spirit. God has poured his Holy Spirit upon every believer, allowing us to be adopted into God's family and empowering us to be God's holy nation and loyal priesthood. Now the prophet Joel anticipated the day of the Lord as a great and dreadful day. It was a day of salvation and judgment. And Jesus came to the world to save it, and one day will come to judge it. 
The prophet visualized a day to come, yet Jesus is fulfilling the prophecy in two parts. In his first coming, about 2,000 years ago, and when he returns in power, glory, and victory on a date unknown. Now, although not much is known about the prophet Joel, we are told some helpful details about the historical context that surrounds these events. At the time of his writing, Israel was enduring a severe locust plague that left the land completely devastated. A lack of food and basic necessities had the priests mourning and the people completely depressed. Can you only imagine? But God specifically sent Joel to his people to call them to repentance. And he allowed, or more, or more accurately caused, this devastation in an attempt to draw his people back to himself. He being God. Because he always tells us that sometimes we need a devastation to bring us back closer to him and to come to him. Isn't that sad? So sad couple lessons here. First of all, never forget. Okay. Joel 1 verse 3 says, Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. A quick glance at this verse may not have a huge impact on us, um, but just think about that. Because what Joel is really doing here is instructing the inhabitants of Israel, those who had just endured a horrendous plague, to make absolute certain that they never, ever forget these events. He is reminding them to share this terrible account and the terrible, out er, excuse me, and the outcome with their children. God already knew his plans and what the future held for his people, but he wanted to make sure that the people of Israel, his chosen people, told their children of his faithfulness and never, ever forgot. We must generally repent. Joel continues in verse 13 to plead with his people to genuinely turn from their wicked ways. In Old Testament times, a grain offering was used as a way of showing God's gratitude for his provision, whereas a drink offering was a sign of God's victory and giving his people rest. Very interesting. Now, both of these offerings of praise were withheld during this time of devastation. Mm. There was simply no joy and no reason in their eyes to offer praise to God who would allow such destruction. It is during the this time that Joel encourages them to not only mourn their sinful ways that have caused such turmoil in the first place, but to also fast. God's word makes it clear that by denying our bodies a physical need such as food, we are, we are more able to clearly come to him in earnest prayer for a spiritual need. Again, very sad. Joel's pleas for Israel to repent and seek forgiveness reveal that up until this point, the nation as a whole was still blind to the fact that they had brought all of this on themselves. They just didn't get it. In much of the same way, we too downplay our sin in the eyes of, the holy, of a holy God and refuse to acknowledge the consequences of our actions. We must learn to genuinely, sincerely, purely, truly repent. Over and over again, we must humble ourselves and seek forgiveness. We have an enemy who wants nothing more than to harden our hearts in an attempt to blind us to our desperate need for a savior. You know what this makes me think of is good people that just don't recognize their sin. Maybe their rudeness, their unkindness. Um, that's hard, right? Because um, if you don't recognize your sin, how can you repent, right? So we really, really need to watch and listen um, to how we act and what we do. Because God in his goodness 
will often allow us to endure difficult life circumstances to open our eyes to the fact that we can not do this life alone. We were created to need him. Huge statement there. We were created to need him. God is rich in mercy. So Joel 2 verses 12 and 13 is one of the most beautiful passages of the Old Testament. Listen here. The Lord tells us to turn to me now while there is time. Give me your hearts. Come with fasting and weeping and mourning. Don't tear your clothing in your grief, but tear your hearts instead. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, slow to anger and filled with unfailing love. He is eager to relent and not punish. These verses perfectly sum up the heart and character of God. He has never been after the destruction and devastation of his people. He is after their hearts. So somewhere now between chapters 1 and 2, God's people finally began to grasp this. And we're told that God had pity on Israel and graciously forgave them and would restore all that they lost. And Lamb, there is a judgment for sin. The second half of Joel primarily focuses on future prophecy. These events weren't specifically for Israel's correction only at this moment, but for future generations, quite possibly a generation much like our own. Yes, it is true that God graciously forgives. However, he cannot forgive if our hearts are not genuinely repentant. Chapter 3 goes on to explain how the nations who did not repent would face God's judgment. And I'll end with this, a final sacrifice. We are sinful people in desperate need of a Savior, our Savior. And so God, in his love, sent Jesus to be that final sacrifice. Christ's shed blood provided a way for us to be eternally forgiven. If we turn from our sin and genuinely seek his forgiveness, we can rest assured of an eternity spent with him. If we do not, however, we will be judged. The book of Joel tells the true account of God's discipline, pursuit, and forgiveness of his people. His forgiveness wasn't only for the love that he held for his chosen people. It was also for the love he holds for every single person that has ever walked on our planet. He protected and provided for Israel so that the world would know that he alone is God. And he alone is worthy to be praised. Amen. Amen. Very interesting. Two little short books, but a whole lot of information. So with that, let us join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord look upon each and every one of you along with this whole world with his favor and give the whole world his amazing peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today is another gift from God, my friends. That's why they call today the present. Make the most of this beautiful day because this is a day that the Lord has made and let us all rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, man. Oh, man. So we got through two books today. Just to let you know, next week 
will be Amos and Obadiah. Possibly Jonah, we'll see. I don't want to make it much longer than what we went today. So have a great week. Again, hope you're um, joining in some uh, Lent services. This week our Lent will be back in Adams at 7 o'clock on Wednesday. Um, so hope to see you all there. Have a great week, my friends. And until then, God bless. Bye for now.